Welcome to the Witness of Persecution podcast with Nick and Ruth Ripkin, where we equip you with biblical principles and truths and practices learned from believers and persecution to help you cross the street and cross the oceans with the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Anthony Ball. And as always, if you're enjoying this podcast, if you are blessed by the teachings of Nick and Ruth and the Witness and Persecution podcast, be sure to like and subscribe to Witness and Persecution. And if you'd be so kind, We'd love for you to leave a review. That helps us continue to get the word out, continue to give these teaching principles, equipping ministry uh, to the global, broader body of Christ. We have Nick join us in the studio today uh, for this episode. And Nick, as we talk about people liking, subscribing, leaving reviews, spreading the message, uh, we're almost at 100 countries uh, that are being listened to by this podcast and uh, it's incredible to see. And uh, we don't want to pinpoint some of those places, Nick, but it's been really neat to see. Uh, we have a lot of places, even in some of the hardest places in the world, they're downloading this podcast. They're listening to this. And so uh, that's a great reminder to our listeners as you are listening. If you like, subscribe, leave a review for Witness and Persecution. As you get the, the word and the message out of this podcast, it is reaching some of these even believers in persecution and, and encouraging them to continue to live, continue to, to do what God has called them to do, to be obedient. And so uh, it's just amazing to see what God is doing all over the globe, not just right here in our corner of the, of the West, but all over the world. So, Nick, I've been talking way too much. How are you doing today? It's a doing. triple digit again here in Texas. So Yeah, I'm so sorry, Anthony. We're, we're approaching 100, but... Oh. Um, not uh, anything like what you all are experiencing. And uh, I'm so sorry that, uh, man, for the people that don't have electricity and, and uh, a a fan in their house, uh, Mm. I I know that it's costing people their lives and, you know, the floods that are around us has just been horrible. And, and Mm. uh, we really need to redouble our prayers for a lot of, uh, in this case, Americans that are suffering. Right, absolutely. And you know what's crazy is I read our weatherman this morning. Uh, he said that this is not even the top 10 of hottest summers in uh, Texas this year, which I can't even imagine uh, what the top 10 <laughs> hot are. So it's been an interesting summer, but we're looking forward to exiting the summer months here pretty quickly. But yeah. Nick... I, uh, you know, we've been we've been talking and we even talked before the show a little bit about, you know, when we go through this podcast, when you when you travel and teach and as people access and they interact with the resources and the material, you know, it can be really easy for us to hear stories and to to listen to to these believers in persecution and it's easy for us, I think, to forget that there are real people behind these stories. You know, there's there's real um, blood, sweat, and tears. You know, sometimes we can uh, skip over the humanity of who these believers are and what they've experienced and kind of look at the victory in persecution, but kind of skip over or pass over the suffering. Um, so can you take a little bit of time today to kind of walk us through, how do we put the humanity back in this? How do we uh, keep ourselves from glorifying the persecution or idealizing the, the victorious nature of these believers without and not skip over uh, the real human suffering and the cost that's involved in persecution? Well, this is so real that uh, one of our sister organizations, and, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not really necessarily recommending this because sometimes it, it it is a way of increasing don- donations but they will sponsor trips where they'll get you know four or five pastors uh lay leaders and, and take them oftentimes in a third country and let them meet these believers in persecution and and hear the stories from them uh as a way of personalizing it but uh, you're right. I, I can sit and talk about uh, how we've learned the, the DNA of the resurrection. 
or the last three podcasts as we've talked about why the unreached are unreached and, and give us uh, conclusions and, and, and illustrate with some stories. But it, it, it even feels like to me, especially in, in our consumer uh, society, where we've reduced uh, our interaction with Almighty God and His people uh, to an hour on Sunday morning, and, and, mm. and sermons that go over 30 minutes uh, get a lot of pushback. Uh, we just don't even have time to hear each other's story and, and, and really be the body of Christ. And I remember trying to, I, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily set with believers in persecution from anywhere from three hours to three days. And, and, and I'm not just a machine that is a, a, a tape recorder with a face on it. Mm. Uh, sometimes uh, I weep. Sometimes, of course, I laugh. Sometimes I just stop the interview and ask uh, that person or that family if I can pray over this situation because it's, it's so heartbreaking. And, 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 and it, it, 99% of the time, I'm talking to the person that went through that persecution. Of course, I can't interview someone who was martyred for the faith. But when I talk to uh, wives, particularly that uh, grew up without, you know, their husband and they killed him after two score years in prison, or talk mm -hmm. to kids that uh, were without their father from the time that they were three years of age, and he gets out 30 years later. Uh, that That is, wow. you, you cannot recover that. There, mm. there is no, we're sorry from a government. There's no pension sometimes that, that can recapture those years. And, and uh, I had been traveling throughout China for about a month and, and just hearing stories after stories after stories just built upon and, and there were just so much victory in them and even mm. in the prison experiences that were very, very common. Um, uh, um, they led so many people to Christ and, and but I asked them and, and, and to, to, take me to those who were still in the midst of this. And, and, and if I could sit with those whose, whose story were in present active tense. And I, I can't tell you what province I was in China. I can't tell you what city, uh, what specific location. They just picked me up and we drove all day. And, and all I remember was we drove near this great big prison in China and they drove me about three blocks away from that prison. And they said, uh, uh, the driver and another guy were in the vehicle and the driver stayed with the car. And this man that, uh, was taking me around got out and walked me about three blocks in between all these little shacks set up, you know, the way governments, when they build stuff for people like this, they're all in a the row. They're all the same exact structure. And there's no difference whatsoever. And he walked me to this guy's house. And he said, now, and this was at uh, a few minutes after midnight. And he said, now, you remember, we walked three blocks and then you saw this building, a certain kind of building, and that's where the car will be. We'll come back at 4 o'clock. Hmm. And if you're not there by 4.15, you're going to have to stay 24 hours. Because wow. that's when, after that, uh, the security police start sweeping the area and making their rounds from the prison. And if you're not here between 4 and 4.15, you'll have to go back to the house and... and and uh and and stay there and so they uh knocked on the door and this broken 
a stooped, uh, skeletal-looking, very old gentleman answered the door and, and said something in Chinese to uh, my escort. And we closed the door behind, and I looked around, and as I came in on the left of his uh, one-room apartment uh, was a, a small desk table made out of balsa wood, you know, just really light wood. Yeah. And on that, on, on above that desk hung the only light bulb, no shade, nothing, just a bare light bulb uh, from the ceiling. And on that table desk was a great big family type Bible, a porcelain plate, uh, you know, curved up, could be a bowl, a plate, um, on one side, a knife. And the other side, a spoon. Uh, that's all that's there. Uh, maybe six feet away was a, a rawhide string bed with a very thin mattress on it and a very thin blanket over it. Uh, there was uh, one shelf in the wall uh, uh, about uh, six feet tall, and it had three canned goods in it. There were a couple big wooden uh, pegs in the wall. One held his wooden coat. Uh, another one held a, a, another change of clothes. And that was his world. That's it. Mm. Electricity for uh, a, a light bulb. No television. No radio. Uh, just this scarred, broken man. uh, uh uh, in the room by himself. And he told me that 33 years before that they had arrested him because he refused to give up his relationship to Christ. And they put him in that prison that was just three blocks away. And they put him in a cell, in a corner cell, by himself where he couldn't talk to anybody else and they would let him out to the exercise yard for an hour each day. And, and, and there he was for 33 years. Wow. He was in prison more than anybody else that I interviewed across the planet. And they put so much pressure on his wife that she had divorced him, or, or that's what they told him, but she had disappeared. He never heard from her after being in prison for six months. Uh, he had three boys. Uh, they disappeared. He didn't know whether they were alive, whether they were dead. But all that they told him is that uh, your wife denied her faith and uh, she divorced you and she's remarried somewhere in China. And, and, and when he would ask about his boys, they would just look at him and smile an evil smile. And for 33 years, he's in that prison going to the exercise yard. Uh, I think he worked, um, he worked in a shop where he made and repaired prison uniforms. Uh, that, that was his, his job that gave him the right to have food and, and, and to pay for his room in the prison. What, what our listeners need to understand don't don't have in your mind an American prison. Uh, the government makes you pay for the cell that you're in. And if you're going to have oftentimes change of clothes, shoes for the winter, if you're going to have a toothbrush and toothpaste, and you're going to have food and water, your family has to provide it. The, the government provides nothing. Mm. And, and they brag that they're providing you a place to live. And they brag that they're letting you stay alive. And, and so his wife's gone. Uh, his kids are gone. It's a very abusive environment. Uh, he, he's working sewing by hand, uh, prison uniforms, just the basic uh, uh, things to eat. And, 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 the thing is, they never charged him with a crime. They never even wow. charged him with the crime of being a Christian. They just put him in prison for 33 years. 
and, and then just psychologically and mentally low level uh, physical persecution uh, for all those years. And they just broke him. Uh, he had a nervous breakdown. They broke him physically. They broke him psychologically, mentally. And, and as I met him in that, in, in his room, I was sitting on the only chair in that room and he was sitting on the side of his bed and he was telling me the story of all the stuff they did to him, all the abuse by other prisoners and how bad it was. And Anthony, this man would start sobbing and he would get up out of that, off the side of that bed and walk over to that little table that was next to the door where you came into that one room apartment and he'd sit in that little wooden chair uh, where there was a, 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 a knife and a spoon and, and that porcelain plate and he would open that big family Bible and he would start reading from it and he would start uh, singing and he would just weep and he'd just cry and he would just pour his heart out to Jesus. And, and that's the only word was the word for Jesus and Christ that I could understand. And Anthony, he would do that for 30 minutes, for 45 minutes. And then he would sort of come to himself and he would look over and see me and he'd say, who are you? Mm. Where, where, where did you come from? How did you get here? And I would remind him that I'd been there for an hour or so and, and that we'd been talking about his life and his faith. And he said, oh, 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 uh, now I, I remember. And he'd come over and I would remind him where he left me in his story. And he'd start talking again and he'd get so broken after uh, over something that they had done to him and and, and what they allowed other prisoners to do to him. And he'd just cry and he'd get up out of that, off that bed and he'd go over and he'd read from the Psalms and he'd start singing in this broken, uh, uh, you know, shaking voice and just holding on to that table and, and, and just cry out to God and just weep in the presence mm. of the Lord. And, and I'm just watching this man broken from the inside out mm. and he'd wow. look up and he, he and he'd say uh who are you oh i remember and sometimes i'd have to remind him and this went on for over you know for almost five hours and 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 and, and finally he got deeply into toward the end of his story and it was breaking him so much that he just went over to that table and he, he's just now continuing in English. Oh, Jesus, why are you leaving me here? Why, why has all this happened? Why won't you let me come home? Jesus, just let me come home. The only thing that he went into that prison with, well, he went in with three boys and a wife, and his faith. And he came out with his faith. Wow. He lost his house. He lost his property. Lost his family. Lost his job. Uh, there was nothing but this husk of a man. And it got to be right on to uh, 4 o'clock uh, in the morning. And he's just weeping over that Bible. And, and, and Anthony... Uh, this man was was so much more aware that he was in the presence of God than he was of being aware that I was in the room with him, uh, that when I walked out of that room, it was as if I was walking away from two people because the presence of God in this man's crying and his praying and reading the Psalms out loud, and he would sing out loud. It was obvious to me. He was much more aware of God than he was of me. Uh, let me back up a little bit. When, when they released him from that prison, 
he wouldn't leave. Hmm. They unlocked his cell and told him to go home. He didn't have a home. So he just said, you have not charged me with a crime. And therefore, until you apologize, he said this to the warden of the communist prison and his guards. He said, you have mistreated me and abused me and, and, and done physical things to me or allowed others to do it for 33 years. And you've never charged me with a crime. You've never had me sign a paper. You've never taken me to a judge. I am not going to leave until you apologize. Well, they're not going to. So finally, they got tired of his demands, and they locked the chair cell behind him. And so he, he would stand in the courtyard of the prison, and he would sleep in a corner of that courtyard. And every morning, he would get up, and he would demand from his guards, and if he could see the warden, uh, he'd demand from them to apologize for holding him for no reason for 33 years. Well, the reason was he was a Christian, but wow. they never charged him with that. And so here he is. He will not leave the prison. They locked his cell. Therefore, he went out in the compound where people exercised and and, and met one another, and he stood there every day yelling for them to apologize, for them to ask for him to forgive him, and they wouldn't do it. And he did that for a month or so until they threw him out of prison and locked him out of the prison. Mm. Incredible. Rather than locking him in, they locked him out. So he just slept at, and he stood at the door of the prison every day beating on the door of the prison as loudly as he could, yelling at, 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 at the guys up on the wall and the guards, uh, demanding that they apologize for taking his wife from him, taking his children from him, taking his job, taking his life, taking all the experiences that he could have had. And now uh, uh, he refused to meet, leave his cell. Then he refused to leave the the courtyard of the prison. Now he's sleeping at the, at the gate of the prison. And every day he, he beats up on the, the metal door demanding that they apologize for holding him uh, uh, captive for all of those 33 years that finally uh, they gave him a, a, a one room house, three blocks from that prison. And every day uh, after sleeping in that house with, just three canned goods and any things that the neighbors would give him to, to live on, uh, uh, to eat. And every day he walked those three blocks or so back to the prison and he beat on that metal door and he demand whoever showed up uh, for them to apologize and to ask him for forgiveness for arresting him and holding him for 33 years. And he did that every day. Wow. And here I sat with one of the most faithful but broken physically, psychologically, emotionally. I, I don't really know that he was broken spiritually, uh, but he was just a husk of a human being. And about mm. 4 o'clock that morning, after, you know, numerous times, him going to that table, weeping, singing, crying, and, and then looking at me and saying, who are you? How did you get here? Why are you here? And each time reminding him who I was and why I was there, what we had talked about, and then trying to get him to continue the conversation. And when I slipped out of his apartment, a little bit after 4 a.m. in the morning, because I didn't want to uh, miss my ride, uh, he was sitting uh, at that desk under that one bare uh, light bulb at that table uh, with his hands uh, on, on and arms on, on that table with that Bible open to him. And he's just crying out to God, just as broken as he can be. Mm. 
and I left him there. And about two months later, uh, two to three months later, uh, the Chinese guy who, who lived in Taiwan and had moved to the West Coast and got me in and out of China and set up appointments for me uh, four times over many, many years, uh, contacted me and said, I, I know that you'll want to know that that old man used his name uh, that uh, had that prison experience that you told me was particularly devastating to hear for you. I just wanted you to know uh, that he died. And I mm. said, I am so thankful to God because when I walked out of that door and I look back at him and him not, he's not even aware that I'm leaving, more of him was in the presence of God than was in that room. Mm. And I just know, mm. I, I know as much as I'm seeing your face right now and, and cherish you and your wife's and family's uh, uh, friendship and, 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 and our work together, I, I just know that he was sitting at that table. Uh, oftentimes he would read the Psalms and sing the Psalms and just cry out mm. to Jesus and, and just uh, watch his tears fall on the pages of his Bible and I just know that Jesus reached down and, and, and pulled him into his presence. And when he raised his head up, uh, seemingly from that desk and that table in that one room, uh, house that replaced a one room cell that he had for 33 years, that he looked up and he looked in the face of Jesus and Jesus said to him, well done. Mm. Well done. Welcome home. Wow. You're home. And I've never been so broken in my life and at the same time so grateful to God in my life that God reached down with him bowed over his Bible at that little balsa wood light table that porcelain plate that one spoon and that one knife and the three canned goods on the shelf his winter coat hanging on a peg and one change of clothes and now oh he's got a reward mm. he's heard jesus say well right. done my servant uh, uh, uh and and just uh, whatever heaven is like he gets a full measure of it. And if mm. we set at Jesus' feet, however that works out, I, I know this guy has a front row place of honor. And I mm. know that as the stories are told uh, by the Spirit of God or by God himself to those who are gathered there, that this man's story is one of the lead stories that the congregation of the faithful get to hear. Mm. I've never, I've never had experience like that, Anthony. Oh, I'm where sure. someone, where someone is so much more aware that he's in the presence of God than that he is in a physical existence on this planet. And I want, our uh, listeners to appreciate and maybe even stop for a moment uh, when we finish this podcast and thank God uh, for literally hundreds of thousands of men, women, and families like this, many recorded in, in the pages of the Bible. And, and, and then it would take thousands and thousands of other uh, holy books uh, to record the stories of those who like Daniel, who like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who like those in the book of Hebrews, uh, those who were delivered and those who were devoured by animals and torn in two and beheaded and, and uh, killed by the gladiators and, and, and those who were 
and I had a horrible ending. And I just want our listeners to appreciate because, as I've said before, words on a piece of paper involve 6% of communication. And the, the, the glory and the inspiration of the Bible is indeed the words on the paper, but that they're highlighted by the Holy Spirit of the living God. And they have spiritual flesh upon them. And, and, and they're, it's not just 6% inspirational words. It's endowed by the very breath of God that when we take the time and we recognize the Holy Spirit that has filled our hearts and indwells every, every molecule of our being, uh, that the Word of God, what it does, it ushers us with prayer into the very presence of the living God. Mm. And, and, mm. and seldom, if ever, on this earth, have I ever experienced someone that was more aware of the presence of God than he was the presence of anybody else, even sitting four to six feet away from him. Wow. I, um, I was so glad to hear that he'd gone home. And Anthony, I, I don't dare uh, uh, turn this man into a statistic, uh, or, or or to turn this man into a, a teaching point. Right. That that all of this victorious living that we talk about in these podcasts, uh, they've got real drops of blood behind them. Mm. They they've got decades of not getting to spend uh, you went to prison and and, and you had a, a new bride and you come out of prison and she's in her 50s or 60s you go into prison and you've got a couple kids out playing uh, outside of your house and a, a nursing baby inside the house and you come out of prison and they're adults with their own mm. families. And, and you've missed all of that. And, and, mm. and I've often wondered, heaven's got to be a glorious place to replace and undo everything that believers in persecution have lost and all that they've suffered. Uh, yeah. You, uh, you, you dare not. We dare not dress up their suffering and turn it into a picnic. Mm. Or, or, or that we imagine that they are so filled with the Spirit of God that when the rod hits their back, it, it doesn't hurt. And when the whip uh, it, it, it is slashed across their, their thighs, it, it doesn't bleed. And when their head when their faces are pushed down into a, a, a squatty potty, that, that somehow that is a, 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 an experience that everyone ought to have. Mm. Oh, Anthony, uh, this guy was the epitome that proves the truth that it's not the physical beatings, though they were horrible, that they remember and that keeps them awake at night and makes them cry out. It's the psychological. It's the separation. It's the lost years that can't be redone or recovered. Mm -hmm. it, 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 is, it is all the things that they, they do to you uh, psychologically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, trying to break you that are the real byproducts of persecution. Mm. And so I hear again their words when they say to me, we believe that we were holding Satan hostage in his own backyard where there's little faith 
so that you in America would be more free to share Jesus with little cost. Hmm. And to go on to say, don't you dare waste our suffering. Don't you hmm. dare give up in freedom, spiritual freedom, that we never give up in persecution. And that is our witness to the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Oh, Anthony, sometimes I'm fearful. And what I'm afraid of is that as believers in persecution, sometimes uh, this is not what I'm afraid of. This is what I've watched. When they are uh, 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 rescued and extracted from their country of persecution and brought to the West, and they see the almost total lack of witness and they see the way that we uh, uh, treat the foreigners in our midst and the way that we uh, uh, cavalierly go by, pass by our involvement in, in church or, or, or spiritual gathering. And when they see how they have suffered for Christ in their country and how we treat Jesus in just in a cavalier way in our country, uh, that breaks them often more than the persecution did. Mm. I can't when imagine. they, when when they are willing to die for Christ in their country, and they come to uh, America and they've got the scars on their wrist and the scars on their ankles from the manacles, and they've got the whip mark still on their backs and and you can tell that they were willing to die for Jesus and they're rescued to Europe and they're rescued to America and they look at the lack of witness and the lack of love that we have for one another and the meager amount of of worship that takes place in our homes and in our buildings that we call churches mm. uh, uh, they uh they survive the persecution in their country. Oftentimes they don't survive the Christianity they find in our country. Wow. I promise wow. you, I promise you that what would not break them in their country of origin, when they see mm. uh, they have an image in their minds of, of the lives of normal Christians in America that sent out missionaries to their countries and, and shared Christ with them so clearly and with so much conviction. And, and they, they believe that there is a, this is uh, the uh, representative of the way that Christianity is generally uh, across the street as well as across the oceans. And when they find the, the nature of the body of faith uh, when they come to the West, that often breaks them in a way that person never, persecution never could. Mm -hmm. But I want you to, I want us to remember uh, this old man uh, today and to thank God for him and for hundreds of thousands just like him who are paying big prices and that their persecution becomes so intense and, 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 and is so overwhelming that they allow themselves to be in the presence of God in such a way that God, Jesus himself, is more real to them in that cell, in that one-room house, uh, in that compound of a prison than is uh, the unseen is more real to them than what is seen. Incredible. Today, today, let's embrace the unseen. Let's embrace mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit of the living God. 
let's give flesh and breath through our witness uh, 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 to the presence of God, uh, to our neighbors, uh, to the strangers who are in our midst, and let us be aware more of the Jesus who walks beside us, within us, then we're aware of the evil that is in our midst also. And may God today lift up, strengthen, embolden, and give our brothers and sisters in chains uh, strength for this day, knowing they aren't forgotten. They are prayed for. They are honored. And what I pray for more, most is that they're more aware of the presence of God in their midst than they're aware of their persecutors in their jail cell. Mm. Wow. Wow. Nick, I don't want to add anything, take anything away from the power of that story and the power of that truth that you shared. And so we'll just leave it at this today for our listeners. When you turn this episode off, after you've listened uh, to this episode, we want you to just kind of sit in it and consider and pray. Uh, what is it? What does it mean to take these truths to heart and to live them out? Nick, thank you for that incredibly powerful example and story. Wow. This has been Witness and Persecution with Nick and Ruth Ripkin, and we'll be with you next time. <laughs>